Hello and welcome to another Uptime FM episode. I'm your host, Sean C. Davis, and today I am joined by Ember Stevens to explore documentation for developers. Now, writing and maintaining documentation can be a crucial part of delivering a successful product to your users. And given that it's a good portion of the work I do for StackBit today and something I think about every day, and it's where Ember spends most of the, her time for Launch Darkly, I'm, I'm really looking forward to digging into some of the most challenging aspects of that process today, because I particularly find it pretty challenging. So with that, let's bring Ember on stage. Thanks for joining the show, Ember. Hey, thanks for having me. Really excited for this talk, but before we get into the uh, shop talk, I need to start with our everyone's everyone's favorite question on the show, which is, "What is the best sandwich?" Um, you know, I'm kind of a sucker for like a classic cold cheese sandwich. You know, just bread, mayo, cheese, some pickles, lettuce, maybe some tomato. Like I could eat that every day. Love it. Ooh, interesting. Okay, so. You, you have a lot of toppings, but you you call it a cheese sandwich. So I, I feel like the cheese is very important then. So what um, do you have like a go-to type of cheese or do you do you switch this in and out? Oh, um, you know, if, if you just like, if it's like a mellow day, then a good Munster is nice, you know, just, you know, it's easy. Um, but, you know, if you're feeling like a little spicier, some pepper jack, also very nice. I like that. Okay. And so the the cheese is cold, but the is the bread toasted or is there a specific type of bread? Um, no, I, I would say, you know, I don't go for the toasted cause it kind of hurts the top of my mouth. Um, okay. you know, fair, so, fair so, so yeah. Just... <laughs> okay. And all right. So last, last sandwich question then is, um, I, I've come to in, in the last couple of years, get more, as we talk more about sandwiches, I get more opinionated about sandwiches and the, I found the pickle to be very important and there's a wide range of pickles. So now is there a specific pickle that goes on this sandwich as well? Um, I mean, I would say the standard, of course, is dill, but I, I love pickles. So um, if you get something, you know, like pickled carrots, pickled cauliflower, um, when you start, you know, even the pickled beets, like those other vegetables um, that are also mm. a little bit sweet, those are really nice too. That's interesting. And then you can kind of like, you, you can just pile on the veggies and it's it's still mm -hmm. like a little salty, a little sweet. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. this sounds like an amazing sandwich. All try right, it. all right, I'll bite. <laughs> I'm gonna try it. Okay, so with that, let's, um, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to spend most of our time today on documentation and I, I think specifically documentation for developers or, or for products that have uh, uh, at least an aspect that caters to developers. A and I have, I have, of course, because I think about this every day, I have tons and tons of questions, but I thought it would be uh, good to probably just let's, let's set the context first. And you're a technical writer and spend most of your day um, writing documentation for Launch Darkly. So can you tell us a little bit about what is uh, a day in the life of Ember like at work? Yeah. Um, so, well, I, uh, I work on a team of three, so there's two other technical writers, and um, we manage all of the technical documentation for the product. So um, we spend a lot of our time uh, working directly with the engineers, um, tracking new features that are coming out and um, keeping up with changes to current features or uh, current functionality. Um, so, you know, we're talking with folks to make sure we know what's what's coming down the pipe with the product. Um, and we also manage um, our API documentation. So um, we work with the engineering teams. Typically, we'll, um, they'll, you know, PR in their changes to endpoints, and then we'll review them and make sure it's kind of up to standards and meets our style guide and that sort of thing. Um, so it's really a mix of, you know, just sitting down and in front of our editor and writing um, as well as kind of the, you know, larger just project management, making sure that that we know kind of where everything is at in the um, sort of in uh, the development cycle and making sure that we have documentation ready by the time the future is ready to release. Okay, so you, you're, you are talking with engineering team way before um, anything is ready to release. Are you... Are, are you having to sit in meetings with the engineering teams or are you like, how, how are you making sure that you uh, stay up to date? Yeah. So in the beginning, we ask that the engineering teams invite us to kick off meetings. So whenever there's, you know, sort of a large new feature that um, we're planning, we want to know about it ahead of time, kind of have an idea of what it might look like. Um, and then we ask if it's a brand new functionality, um, we do ask the engineers uh, provide just some first draft documentation. So, um, so they let us know, you know, what is this functionality? 
um, what does it do? How does it help the customer? What does it look like? That sort of thing. Um, and uh, so we're not necessarily involved in every single meeting, every step of the way, because that would be overwhelming, but we kind of near the beginning and then as the project is getting um, near to completion. So ideally about two weeks before the um, feature is being released, we like to um, have sort of that first draft to, to get an idea of, of where we're at and, and start refining it so it's ready to go for the release. Okay, so you're able to play around in some staging environment. Or, yeah, or yeah. Like Okay. Yeah, so that's really important. It's um, it's nice to be able to get our hands on the feature and and test it before it goes out for sure. Definitely. Okay. Now you also mentioned API documentation, and that's like it's a very different type of documentation. And um, I you you said adhering to standard. You want to make sure that the engineers are adhering to standards. What did you mean by that? Um. So you know, even just um even small things to start out with. So making sure that, um, you know, certain, um, the way that we describe certain endpoints, do you use punctuation at the end or not? Um, uh, if they're, you know, all our, are our error messages consistent? Um, do we use the same tense? You know, are we using singular, plural, just things like that, that, um, you know, they're small and most folks don't really, you know, don't think about them because they don't have to, but um, it just makes for, a better polished final product to have that sort of thing consistent. Um, and, um, you know, we also, there's different engineering teams that are working on different endpoints. So they're not necessarily uh, looking at the API documentation as a whole all the time, like we are. So we have a little bit mm -hmm. better idea of, you know, the tone and, and what sort of fits with what we have already. That's super interesting. So you're not, you're not, you're not physically writing the code, but you have, um, or, or you're at least, reviewing and helping folks, the folks who are writing the code to make sure that, um, yeah, the, the content that is embedded in the code is, uh, it, it's, it's consistent throughout your organization. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And, and the other question I had on API documentation was that I've, I've seen some, um, some startups will automate that, like the, that the documentation will get pulled from comments in the code or, or what have you, do you keep these things entirely separate? So your, your documentation is just written and managed by your team, or do you pull actually any, um, any content from the code base into your docs? Um, yeah. So for, we manage our product documentation and our IP, uh, API documentation, um, differently. So for the API docs, um, we use an open API spec and then we uh, publish it with Redocly. So um, it is all of the, um, uh, all of the endpoints are in our code base and then they're sort of automatically pulled in and published um, through Redocly. Um, for our product docs, um, it, it's managed a little bit differently. We have um, a little bit more, uh, I would say a little bit more control over that in the sense that that repo is sort of ours and ours alone and we own that and um, we're, uh, and we make sure that we approve anything, any changes or anything that gets PR'd into that repo. Um, so that's kind of our, our own little domain for our product docs. Okay. Okay. Super interesting. All right. Now taking a step back for a minute, um, I, I know as a writer and I'm, I'm a team of one or one and a half um, at, at my job, but that there's so much to write about and there's way more to write about than there is time. So I'm curious, how do you, um, how do you prioritize? How do you decide where to spend your time? Yeah, that's a, that's the ongoing challenge, right? You know, we, we always have to balance um, writing about new features and getting excited about stuff that's, you know, coming out and then also maintaining what we have and making sure that, um, the documentation that we have already published is still accurate and updating it when the UI changes, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, our, so our manager, um, she does a lot of work to uh, make sure that she is aware of all of the projects that are um, coming down the pipeline. And um, she's kind of our, our first line of defense in prioritization and um, delegation. And um, so that's, that's helpful to have someone who's, um, uh, part of her primary role is is to make sure that she's on top of um, everything that's going on, um, and then it helps a little bit, you know, for the for the two the other writer and myself, we kind of have our own areas. Um, you know, we 
we, for the most part, share documentation. We're not too siloed, but we have a few things that we sort of focus on. So um, my colleague, actually, she focuses on the API documentation a lot more than, than I do, and, and she really manages that. And um, I, uh, I write about our experimentation product a little bit more and um, have more focus on that product, which has a lot of changes and is developing pretty quickly. So um, having uh, kind of the divide and conquer helps us manage a little bit as well. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Okay, and so when you're when you're writing a, a new piece of documentation, um, I know the part of the question there is where, like, what exactly is it, but also where does it go? How is it organized? And I know um, you know your your product is is definitely established, and so you've you have a structure in your documentation. But um, curious if you could if you could um, talk a little bit about that to folks, like how have how has your team thought about the actual structure and organization of the content itself? Yeah, I mean, thinking about structure and organization is um, almost as big of a job as is the writing itself, right? You know, and mm -hmm. since I've been with LaunchDarkly, we've had a few sort of large overhauls in the way that um, we present some some of our documentation, particularly around our um, SDK documentation. We had a we had a big overhaul in the way that that we organized it um, about a year or so ago. Um, and you know, it's tough, it's hard. It, it takes some time and thought and, um, we, you know, often the three of us will kind of get together and we'll say, okay, you know, we know that maybe the structure isn't working quite right, or maybe this isn't quite the flow that the reader, um, normally goes through whenever they're using this part of the product. So, um, we'll get together and sometimes we'll just try different things and we'll say, well, what if we move this section over here or what if we organized it this way? And then we'll look at it and say, Oh no, never mind. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, so some of it's trial and error and some of it is um, talking with the engineers and um, getting an idea of, you know, kind of the flow that they're envisioning um, when we're looking at how a customer might use the product, but then also looking at um, what our readers, what are they searching for? What are they clicking on? Um, if they're searching for certain terms a lot, where do they end up? And using that um, data to kind of inform how we organize things as well. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Okay. So I, I was thinking about this as, as you were saying that, um, you know, it's like, how do you, how do you pinpoint um, when something isn't right? And it, it seems like, it's par partly that you're talking to users, but also there's just kind of a feeling. I don't know. Can you can you describe that feeling of when something you know something's wrong? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I actually I just had a, a sort of an example of this um, the other day when uh, we're working on um, sort of a big project right now. And I was doing a lot of re reviewing of the work we'd done so far. And I was getting a little bit tripped up with um, how we were labeling things. And then I stopped and I said, OK. If I don't understand this, if this is giving me trouble, it's definitely giving our readers trouble, right? Because I look at this all the time. And um, if I'm thinking, oh, this isn't quite right. So just because it makes sense to me doesn't mean it'll make sense to the reader. But if it doesn't make sense to me, that's that's a big warning flag. Um, Interesting. Yep. Yeah. And we also, you know, we look at... Um, you know, sort of the opposite. If there's topics or pages that no one ever goes to and no one looks at, then we have to think about either it's in the wrong place or it's information that nobody's finding helpful. And so um, then we think then too about what we might want to do with that. What's your time frame on that to, to um, you know, like how, how much time has to go by with nobody really using the content before you say, eh, this isn't right? Um, you know, I don't, I don't really have a number for that. Um, we tend to look at our stats about once a month, we'll do a check in and kind of see where things are at. Yeah. So um, it's certainly not something where if you say, Oh, nobody looked at it this month, pull it down, but um, we kind of put it on the docket. So let's think about this. And um, over the next few months, let's, you know, continue to kind of watch it and see if um, there's any trends one way or another. And if not, then we then we really need to start thinking about uh, what to do with that information. That makes sense. And I, I would say like another um, another aspect of getting you're, you're like organ another aspect of organization I think is discoverability that it's not just mm -hmm. having the right content necessarily structured or organized in the right way but also built in such a way that uh, that that developers can find what they're looking for and so what strategies do you put in place to maximize the discoverability of that content? 
Yeah, that, that's a great point. You know, we spend a lot of time thinking about organization, but the reality is people just search for things. You know, they just go up to the search bar. And, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. um, uh, within the last year, um, we added a tagging system. So um, previously, you know, it was just doing like content searches um, on the doc site, but now we add tags to every topic, which um, really helps with um, search results. Um, and um, you know, and we test that. So we we add tags, and then we go and you know we do a bunch of searches and see what comes up and see if the things that we're searching for um, actually the, the results make sense. Um, so I, I think that's um, probably probably the the biggest help is really to not necessarily spend so much time thinking about organization that you forget that you know even engineers they just Google things, right? So right, right, yeah. But I, at the same time, I think that we take, uh, or maybe it's that it's that we we tend to lean really hard on Google to say like, well, Google's doing all this work. I told them what this content is, so if somebody's looking for the right thing, they're probably going to find it. And I imagine that's true. But I, I also think that what I've seen is that if develop that might be the front door for a developer, but then they're still interacting with your product, and it's. Uh, I, I imagine some developers go back to Google, but I think a lot also stay on the site. And so then we kind of think about like different navigation strategies that we might have to once the user's in, how do we help them navigate the site? And I can think, well, there's tree navigation and there's the, the main header navigation and you can have their insight search or your you, you mentioned tags or recommended articles or you know something like that. Um, so I was curious because you also or at least what I, what I should say is what I found is I also don't want to um, be overwhelmed as someone who's reading documentation of like clicking all over the place and not being able to focus on the thing I'm trying to find. So I, how do you, um, how, how do you, maybe the question I should ask is how do you help developers or, or readers find the second piece of content that they're looking for? Yeah. Um, well, like you said, I think it's, it's a balance between, um, you know, we, we like to add a lot of uh, links, contextual links saying, you know, if you want to learn more about this, go here. If you want to learn more about that, go there. Um, but it is a balance to not overwhelm the reader with just too much stuff and too many directions to go in. Um, we do, we have a set of guides that are um, a little, they're sort of longer form, um, you know, so you're wanting to learn how to do this. Well, let us take you through that process step by step. And mm -hmm. um, so we try to link to guides where appropriate, where hopefully that will help them if they're really just trying to accomplish a specific um, task that requires a series of steps and is more than maybe just, here's how you create a new flag, here's how you save it, here's how, you know, but like, okay, now you've got this end goal. Um, so uh, linking the readers to these guides, um, hopefully, you know, helps them get the answers that they need and, and get the help that they need. Um, but otherwise, um, yeah, I think just, finding the balance between um, linking an, enough, but not too much to other documentation. Um, when we're guiding readers through procedures, you know, we try not to put a lot of links within the procedure itself. When we say step one, do this, step two, go here, because uh, we don't want to interrupt the reader going through the procedure and have them, you know, wander off to this other, this other topic. So, um, you know, tr trying to sort of streamline it that way um, is helpful. And um, we're also, uh, working on connecting the search within the product itself. So we've got the product and then the product docs. And so if they're in the UI of the product and they're searching to also bring up results, not only from the UI itself, but from the documentation. So hopefully um, as they're in the product, maybe they're frustrated, maybe they're trying to figure out how to do something, they can um, be brought right to the docs and get their answer uh, more quickly that way as well. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so... Now, now back to the procedural content. I think that's really interesting. Of you, you don't want to pull somebody out of a flow that they're in. So it sounds like you, you're also, um, in a way, you're making a, an assumption for the user that they, if they're going through this process, you have to say, uh, I, I, I should say, what, it, would it be fair to say, you have to assume the reader knows certain foundational aspects of your product, so you don't have to be like. Oh yeah, and go here for configuration reference, and go here for this other reference, but just stay focused. Yeah, and we, you know, we try to say before a procedure starts, if there is prerequisite knowledge or prerequisite steps that you need to take before doing this, here's what they are. 
um, again, with the goal that, like you said, you know, the developer flow so that they can say, yes, I have met these prerequisites and now I'm accomplishing the task and nothing is going to interrupt me. And when I'm done with this, with this procedure, my goal will be accomplished, you know, and that's, that's what we're going for. So, um, yeah, just being really clear about here's what you need to know, here's what you need to have done already. And, um, hopefully this will finish it out for you. No. Okay. That makes it, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. I want to jump over to uh, for a minute to, uh, to the maintenance side of things, because I think it can be fun for to to add new stuff, but it, it's like something that's very frustrating to me as a developer is I land on a piece of documentation that's out of date, and so it just it it doesn't it doesn't work. It hurts me more than it helps me, and breaks trust and 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 all of that. So, um, you you mentioned that your manager is helping to figure out the right priorities and all of that. But can you talk a little bit about the process of making sure that everything is staying up to date in your documentation? Yeah, um, we rely really heavily on our engineering teams to let us know when something is changing and, um, you know, with, with existing functionality. So not necessarily, you know, not something new, but, um, and, um, one of the ways that we do that is, uh, you know, we've got what we call blitzes where we go in and everybody kind of tests something as it's being developed all at once. So we can, um, you know, really quickly see where are the bugs and where are the areas that need to be improved on. And we ask that um, that all the engineering teams invite us, the writers, to these blitzes. And that's a really good way to stay on top of uh, changes in the UI or changes in functionality because, um you know, it sort of gets us in there, gets us using it, clicking around, seeing what's going on. And sometimes maybe we'll notice things, even if it's not directly related to what's being updated, we'll see, oh, actually this button is over here now. And um, so um, that uh, is, is really helpful to kind of just continually be in the UI to see what's going on. Um, and, you know, we're, we're also familiar now with what's in the docs and what's in the UI. We usually recognize pretty quickly when something doesn't look quite right. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also, we're really judicious about how we use like screenshots in the docs because it's not helpful to have outdated screenshots because those are confusing. And it's also not helpful to the reader to just show like, you know, this big, you know, screenshot of the UI over and over again. We try to be really specific um, about what we're showing the reader and making sure that it's actually relevant to what we're talking about. And so that helps us not, uh, show visually outdated content at, uh, because we're um, uh, we're just, you know, having really focused screenshots on, on what's what's uh, being updated. Um, otherwise, I mean, you know, sometimes I admit sometimes things do slip through the cracks and we'll notice later, um, you know, we'll be learning about something else or using something and say, oh, hey, actually, I think this flow is a little bit different now. <laughs> um, so it happens. And that's just sort of inevitable whenever um, you've got a small team that's supporting um, uh, a lot of engineers. But um, I think that I, I feel like we keep up with it fairly well, considering. Um, and, you know, and sometimes, um, you know, another way that we we help stay on top of that is our, our revenue team, the folks who are actually working with customers every day. They're really great about coming back to us and letting us know, hey, this doesn't quite make sense. Hey, I don't think it quite looks like this anymore. Um, so they're a really great resource as well. Okay. Okay. That's it. So it's great to have so many, um, so many other team members who are also using the documentation. It's like, it's another form of user that can give uh, almost faster feedback to you, which is, is great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now you can, you could theoretically write forever on a particular topic and say, all right, I'm, I'm just, I'm, digging and digging and digging into the details. How do you know when to stop on any particular guide? Or, I mean, even honestly, even just like an API reference, how do you know when the, you've, you've hit the right amount of content? Um, yeah, you know, I think that that's, um, that's a, sort of a, a common um, thing to do when you're first writing about something is you just write everything you know about it. You know, you think like, this is mm -hmm. everything I know and I'm going to put it all out there. Um, but as, as you know, more experienced writers, uh, you know, move along in their career, they write less and less, right? Um, because you realize, you start to recognize that their reader doesn't necessarily need to know all of that. So I personally approach it by thinking about, um, you know, not what does this feature do, 
but thinking about how does this help the reader? What goal is the reader trying to accomplish? And then really focus on that um, because that's what they care about, right? Like they don't necessarily care about what's going on behind the scenes, um, you know, in some, some cases maybe, but for the most part, they just wanna know how to accomplish the task. So thinking about it from the reader perspective is really helpful rather than your own perspective of what you know. Um, and, you know, getting, um, you know, I'm really fortunate to have a team that can edit uh, my writing, you know, we, we review and edit each other's writing. Um, and having been a solo writer in the past, um, I just, you know, I can't say how valuable it is to have someone else that's able to look at what you write and said, well, you know, you could probably just lose this whole paragraph. Or, you know, this actually could be condensed down quite a bit. Um, so having that second set of eyes is really helpful to, to help curb that as well. And sometimes it can hurt because it's like a half of what you wrote needs to go away. But it, <laughs> if it makes the if it makes the end content better, if it helps the 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 reader, that's the point, right? Right, exactly. Okay, now you mentioned screenshots uh, a little bit ago, and um, this is a, a topic that is super interesting to me because they, uh, I've I've found them to be like it's it's like you said it's really obvious when they're wrong. Uh, but they're also, it's not just a few words that you can change and then they're correct. It's, it's often a process to get them updated. And um, so you talked about finding the, the right moments to introduce screenshots. And I was curious to ask a little bit more about that. Like, do, you f do you find yourself using fewer screenshots because it's difficult to maintain? Or you know, how, do you, how do you determine when you need a screenshot versus when it could pro it's probably okay to just keep the text there? Yeah, um, you know, we sort of, we start from a place of thinking about, um, you know, ideally our documentation would be uh, usable and readable without any screenshots at all because some of our readers aren't cited. And so we have to make sure that what we're including in the documentation is accessible to everyone. So thinking about it from that perspective helps us um, sort of keep them to a minimum because we want to make sure that we're not re overly relying on screenshots to explain how to do something. We really need to make sure we're explaining it in text. Um, so, you know, it's, Screenshots are expensive to maintain, but that's not the only reason that we want to keep them to a minimum. Um, uh, you know, of course, we're, you know, also think a lot about alt text and making sure that uh, we're describing really well what's going on. Um, so uh, generally, if you approach screenshots not as um, not as something that is the basis of your explanation, but is always supplementary, that helps keep them to a minimum and helps you think about your writing in a way that um, doesn't rely on them so much. Makes sense. Okay, and, and do you work with uh, videos at all? Um, not, not really. Um, there are folks in other parts of the company that will make sort of videos um, and sometimes we'll link to them from the docs, um, but we, we simply, we just don't have the team to be able to create and maintain them. They're, you know, extremely time intensive and they go out of date very quickly. And so by the time you're done making them, something's already changed. And um, so, so no, we kind of shy away from those um, unless they're being provided by somebody else. Interesting. Interesting. So it's um, yeah. And what I've found is if you, you make a, a, a video on one particular topic or even a doc, and then you're you're like, oh, I got, I have to change this one thing in the middle. I'm like, okay, I guess I, I need to make the whole video over again. Yeah. <laughs> or it's really choppy and, and messy. So, okay, yeah, that that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, this this has been super interesting, and um, so let's let's uh, stop there and, and transition into the last uh, segment of the show today, where I have nine quick questions, and we'll we'll still touch on a few. Uh, documentation focused questions and, and writing focused questions throughout here. Um, and then we'll round out this episode. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds great. Fantastic. Okay, here we go. Question number one, what is your biggest grammatical pet peeve? Like something that every time you see it, you have to change it immediately. Oh, um, um, you know, this is an unpopular opinion, but uh, the split infinitive. Okay. Okay. All right. Fair. Uh, question number two, what's been a 
uh, what a tool that you use in your writing that has been super helpful to you? I mean, it could be it could be a, a concept, but but I also thinking more like uh, an actual piece of software that is really helpful to you. Um, I mean, you know, I I write in Atom every day, and um, you know, it's not necessarily the most exciting answer, but it's trusty and it works. And uh, so that's, I would say that's what I probably rely the most on day to day. Okay. Question number three, what is, we're, gonna, we're sh shifting, shifting here slightly. What's a, uh, a book that you have read? Or I, I okay, here's how I want to ask this. You can pick one of two, two approaches. One, what is a book that you've read the most number of times, or if there's, not one that stands out. Maybe what's um, what's the best book that you've read? Oh, um, wow. Let's see. Um, honestly, probably the book that I've read the most number of times was probably Lord of the Rings. Um, that was you read to me by my dad when I was a kid, and I just you know it got it got stuck in there somewhere. So um, I've probably read that more than any other book. How many times? Oh gosh, not probably not that many. You know, probably three or four, maybe. Um, I don't reread a whole lot of books, but that's you know, it's a classic. That's a, I mean, that's amazing. That's a lot of uh, four times, three or four times over. That's a lot of pages. That's um, yeah, that's yeah, it is. <laughs> okay, do you, how how old were you when you went through it the for the first time, or when you, um, when your dad read it to you? Oh, he read it just really young, like way before you know. Um, uh, not the age group I imagine it's geared towards. So, you know, elementary school. So I was probably seven, maybe seven or eight. You know, I didn't know what was going on okay. half the time, but I loved it. So. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Okay, number four, uh, what is the thing that you're most proud of in your career? Oh, um, you know, I, um, I've... I've changed career trajectories a few times and um, I was in higher ed for a long time. And um, one of the things that I've been really happy with is I, I really enjoyed working in higher ed, but there were some drawbacks too. And so being able to really think about and find the parts of that career that I enjoyed, which was um, writing uh, educational material and then being able to sort of focus in on that and turn that into a career, um, was really satisfying for me um, to to be able to find exactly what I liked about that and then kind of iterate on it. That's a, that's a really interesting answer to me because I have at various times thought maybe I would do well in a higher education because I like writing con educational mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe I don't know. Okay, number five. What's the, the your favorite music to listen to while writing? If you have one, it can also mm -hmm. be no music. You know, I have to say, I um, I struggle to focus on writing while listening to music. If, if I listen to anything, it has to be without lyrics. Um, but I'm typically just a quiet writer because I I can't I can't focus otherwise. I do the same thing. Do you find yourself if there's lyrics, you just start typing the lyrics? <laughs> I'm like singing along, you know, and I was like, oh <laughs> yeah. no, wait, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. No, no, I have to, and I I'm the same way, and I don't know why why it works this way. But if I'm writing code, it doesn't matter what music is on. In fact, usually, usually the more music that's going on, the better. Sometimes I have to get really deep, but with writing, it's just something that like takes over the brain and mm -hmm. everything else just seems distracting. Yeah. Really agreed. Interesting. Okay. Number six, your, what's your most enjoyable non-text and, and non-writing activity? Um, I, um, I, you know, I enjoy a few different things. I enjoy doing some cross stitch, um, with some other art stuff, but I've gotten, um, in the last couple of years, I've gotten into um, competitive jigsaw puzzling. And so that's Ooh. something that I've, I've been kind of into lately and, uh, it's, it's really fun and interesting. So, yeah. How, how does that work? Are you in, are you physically in a room with other folks? Um, pre COVID that's how it worked. And then during COVID there was, um, couple of years where there was Zoom competitions. So you had your your puzzle out, but your camera was on and then they would record and, you know, watch as you and uh, finish the puzzle and record the times. Um, but now it's it's moving back to in-person again. Very cool. So everyone is presumably doing the same puzzle at mm -hmm. the same yeah. time. Yeah. All right, now how, um, I'm, this is really interesting. So I'm digging into this. How, um, how, many, how many pieces are you typically working with? 
Um, so I've only done it um, as part of a pair and it's 500 pieces for that. Okay. And, and about how long does that take? Well, um, <laughs> depends how good you are. Um, so <laughs> really, really fast pairs can do a 500 piece puzzle in something like 40, 45 minutes, which is amazing what? to me. It's, it's so fast and it just watching it is mind blowing. Um, I think the fastest that uh, my puzzling partner and I have done is um, during a competition. We did about an hour 20. Um, wow. Not during a competition. We've done a little quick, more, more quickly, maybe an hour 10, but um, it's, it's tough. It's tough to cut that's down that a, time. That's amazing. So you probably have to have like a whole strategy and who's doing what, or does it just kind of work? Um, you know, in theory, we have a strategy. Um, and there are, you know, puzzling principles that um, I actually have I've talked about at a couple of conferences and how that applies to tech writing. But when it comes down to it and the clock is running and you're panicking a little bit, sometimes those just go out the window. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. I have, I need to stop. I have so many more questions. Uh, moving on. Number seven, what's the biggest mistake that you've made in your career? Oh, um, probably, um, you know, I, I went to grad school during, um, the like the 2008 recession or you know a little bit after that and probably the biggest mistake that i made was coming out of grad school which was i loved and it was a great experience but i thought uh oh the recession will be over by the time i'm done with this and i'll just glide into a job and i had a, had a kind of a tough time leaving grad school because sort of finding my footing um and so uh i think I think I just made some assumptions about what kinds of jobs would be available to me at that time. And um, it, it took me a while to figure out that I needed to find a little bit different path for myself. Were you graduating in 08 or were you graduating a couple of years? A few years that? after that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was like, oh, we're in a recession. I think I'll go to school like everybody else. And um, and then when everybody else who also made that decision gets out of school at the same time as you, then you're all competing for the same job. So it, it was still it was still tough then. Exactly. I had a, I, I was in undergrad around the same time and had a very similar experience. Like really, to, I got lucky in the internship I found, but then landing a job afterwards was it was like I was kind of forced to go at, uh, go to stay at that company that I had interned because there was just there was nowhere mm. else to go at that time. Yeah. Okay. Number eight. Uh, it was just kind of like flipping number seven uh, around and saying. What is the what's the best career advice that that you've received and, and been able to make use of? Um, you know, I, I've always struggled with promoting myself and um, sort of putting myself out there. Um, and folks have told me, you know, no one is going to advocate for you but you, um, which may or may not be true. But there have been a few times that I've really gone out on a limb and made myself uncomfortable with my own self-promotion and said, hey, I'm interested in working for your company. And um, that worked out really well for me. And so um, even though it, it still feels uncomfortable to me, being able to reach out and just let people know what you're looking for and what you want has has been really advantageous to me. Great. Okay. That's, that's great advice. And I, I'm glad you threw in the uncomfortable part because it's like, it can be super uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Last one. Number nine. Uh, and my, one, my, my second favorite question behind the sandwich question is that you, the scenario is that you can, you can host a lunch where, with anyone, one person, a uh, person can be alive or not hypothetical situation. Um, who would you invite? Oh my gosh. Um, I think, um, I think it would be really interesting to sit down and have a conversation with, uh, Murray Curie. Hmm. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Well, thanks, Ember. This was uh, this was a ton of fun. I really enjoyed talking shop and going through these these last quick questions. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us for this show. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It was great. Absolutely. Now, now, uh, last thing before we go is you can tell listeners and viewers how to get in touch with you if they have any more questions, want to talk some more shop or or competitive jigsaw puzzling. Um, how can they? Yeah. So how can they get in touch with you? And then if you have anything else that you're working on that you'd like to plug, um, take it away. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, nothing in particular to plug, but I'm always interested in connecting with other writers and uh, developers and folks that are interested in it. So um, I'm on Twitter. I'm at uh, Ember underscore Stevens. And I'm also on Mastodon at Ember Stevens at hackydurham.io. So find me either of those places and I'd love to chat. Fantastic. All right. Thank you. Now, to the audience here, a quick reminder that these shows are recorded live on the first and third Thursdays of each month at 1 p.m. Eastern time in the U.S., which is 5 p.m. GMT. The live shows are then later syndicated on CFE.dev and YouTube as videos and also in audio format wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back on December 15th with Samo from Netlify as we explore identifying or maybe even building the perfect JavaScript framework. So until then, from all of us at CFE.dev, thank you for joining us for this show, and we'll see you.